Ever wondered what your GPU actually does in Blender? You upgraded your graphics card, but things still feel slow. Maybe it's not doing what you think it is. I'm Michael, your creative tech chap, and today we're diving into what Blender really uses your GPU for and what it doesn't. Let's clear up some misconceptions so you know exactly where your hardware matters. If you're into Blender, 3D and PC hardware, hit subscribe so you don't miss any future deep dives like this. So let's talk about RAM and VRAM. What's the difference? Before we jump into specific tasks, let's talk about those two, RAM and VRAM. Now, RAM is quick access storage for general data and processing. It's data that's available to the CPU very, very quickly, like a really, 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 really fast hard drive. Now, VRAM is the same stuff but it's on your GPU, it's on the graphics card and it's dedicated to your GPU. And primarily it's gonna be handling things like textures, rendering, viewport performance. If you're using things like optics, it's required to load data into that. Now, some data can be stored in both RAM and VRAM, but running out of VRAM can force Blender to swap data to the system RAM, causing performance drops. And that we want to avoid. On the right hand side of my screen, I have Task Manager. And on the left-hand side, I have the default Blender scene. Let's have a quick look at RAM usage and VRAM usage and how they differ. If we have a look down at the bottom here, we can see we've got memory, 25.6 gigs. This is the memory usage of the scene in Blender. And you may wonder, how is the VRAM usage so high? Well, unfortunately, this here is reported based upon the system's usage of VRAM, not just Blender. If we have a look at the amount of RAM being used, this 25.6 megabytes, we can see over here, or maybe bytes, because it's actually got the MI there, um, we've got Blender over on the task manager using 287. So this is the program as well. This is just the scene. Not so when it comes to the VRAM. If we go to our performance tab, we can see that the GPU is in fact being utilized. This is because I'm recording with OBS at the moment. So there is a bit more activity than there might be on your computer at the moment. And of course, we're encoding a video. And then here, we've got our dedicated GPU memory usage. This is kind of the graph that we're going to be focused on because we'll see it go up and down depending on whether or not we're loading things into the GPU's memory, the VRAM. And just as a quick example here and a shameless plug, if I go ahead and open up one of the project examples from one of my new courses, you can check that out in the description below. We can see here, this is a very simple scene. It's a nighttime scene with a bit of a church there. We can see that the memory usage has gone up, as has the VRAM use. There aren't any textures in this scene. I'm using optics to denoise, and that will also use some of your VRAM in order to do that. And we'll look at all of this in a little bit more detail when we get to texturing as well to see how that affects our RAM usage, whether it's system memory or the memory on our graphics card. Let's talk about viewport performance. When does the GPU help? Well, there are two modes where the GPU comes into play. We've got material preview and the rendered view. Material preview is basically EV, and it uses the GPU to show some shading and lighting and textures, and it changes in real time and updates. Now, since EV Next, that does benefit from a better GPU, but not as much as Cycles does. When you're in the viewport, those rendered modes are typically a little bit more cut down than if you're doing a full render, and you can certainly lower the quality of that as well. Now, wireframe and solid view, they're mostly CPU driven. Finally, sculpting. Geometry heavy, that's going to be CPU bound, but the viewport performance can improve a little with a stronger GPU, but typically that won't matter. So in front of us, we have a cube. Let's bring up statistics as well so we can see what's going on in our world. So this cube has, let's count the triangles. It's got 12 triangles. Let's go ahead and subdivide it five times. We're now at 12,000. Look at the memory jump. I'm going to apply that. So I'm going to go over to the modifiers tab and apply that. Now we're going to do the same thing again. Now we're using a gigabyte of data and we're using 12,000. Okay, that's quite a bit there. If we go ahead and apply that as well, 
we get to the point where we start Blender slowing down. Now, this is a very simple scene at the moment. However, if we to start doing something like sculpting, which is the moving around of these vertices, we can see that as we start drawing on it, if we have a look at the CPU usage, it goes up. And that's because we're manipulating the vertex data itself. We're not really loading anything into RAM or anything along those lines. And this number of vertices, it can actually work with pretty well these days. So we're up at 6 million. That's quite a lot of detail that we've got here. However, when you reach a certain amount, and it does depend on your system, you get to a point where Blender cannot manipulate the vertices quickly enough to keep things real time. Okay, so let's talk about rendering. This is a big one. Whether it's cycles or EV rendering, a powerful GPU is essential. The better the GPU, the faster that rendering is going to happen. CUDA, Optics, and Metal for Max accelerate your rendering massively. And if you want the fastest, most usable and stable performance, Apple Silicon and NVIDIA are currently the tech to have. And just make sure that you have it turned on in the preferences. Otherwise, you will still be using your CPU to render, which will be a lot slower. So using my CPU as a proxy for a slower GPU, we can see here it took 1 minute 48 seconds, nearly 1 minute 49 to actually render this scene. If I switch over to slot 2, this was using the GPU, and you can see here it was done in 10 seconds. That's a huge saving. If I was just rendering the one image, it wouldn't matter. But if this was an animation, that would make a huge difference on the time it took to complete that task. And no matter what graphics card that you're using, it's really important that you actually have it turned on and activated. You'll see under the render engine option cycles, we have a device. Now by default, it will use a GPU if you've got it on EV, but with cycles, you can switch it between GPU compute and CPU compute. And I've even seen it on some computers, including this one when I upgraded the graphics card, even though GPU compute was selected, it didn't actually use the GPU. So flick these backwards and forwards if you're unsure. And if it's not available down here, if it's grayed out, you can go to your edit preferences. And once you've done that, go down to the system tab. Once you're there under cycles, render device, make sure optics or CUDA is selected if you're on Nvidia and we've got HIP and one API for, I think that's Intel and AMD, but I don't have those cards to test. And once that is activated, you should see your scene being able to be rendered and it will update much faster. If I switch this back to uh, CPU, you can see whilst it does update, it is a lot slower and a lot more jerky. So a better GPU improves performance. And if you're wondering how your current or future GPU might stack up, I've taken a look at Blender Performance recently, and I'll link that in the video description below so you can see where your current GPU or your next one sits in the stack. Now, whilst we're here, let's cover animations. While rendering those frames of an animation will be GPU accelerated if you're rendering it in EV or Cycles, playing back the animations in the viewport is CPU bound. And finally, I'll lump compositing in here as well, as it is part of the rendering pipeline. Recently, it has had a GPU acceleration, which is just a huge leap forward. And I'm not entirely sure if all of the nodes yet are GPU accelerated, but one thing to remember is you do have to turn it on separately, and I'll show that just here. It's hidden away under the render tab. Under performance, which is the same on both EV and cycles, there is the compositor. You drop this down and make sure that GPU is selected. Next, let's cover modifiers and geometry nodes. Most modifiers are going to be CPU driven. You're basically changing, you're modifying the geometry. Complex geometry calculations like Boolean or subsurface division will slow down without a strong CPU. So that is really nothing to do with the GPU. And geometry nodes is much the same. It's all about calculations and therefore it's going to be CPU bound. But in some aspects, since you tend to build up scenes that have textures and materials on your objects, viewport performance can benefit from having a good GPU. Let's talk about textures and environments. Now, this is a big one. Textures use both RAM and VRAM. Large textures can quickly fill up VRAM and Blender will offload them to the system RAM if it can. And this can significantly slow down your rendering performance if this happens, if not stop entirely because you ran out of memory. 
Environment textures, HDRIs, stored in VRAM, they affect the real-time lighting in EV and cycles, and they can also take up a huge amount of space. And displacement mapping can be GPU accelerated, but complex displacement still requires GPU calculations. Okay, so whilst this might be a little bit of a convoluted example, I'm gonna show you the effect that textures can have on both your RAM and your VRAM. So this scene is currently using around 233 megabytes or maybe bytes of RAM. Uh, ignore the amount of VRAM currently being used. I've got Resolve open in the background and a lot of other things going on, but we will see that increase as well when we start adding textures. First of all, let's start with an environment texture. From an environment texture, you can often get lighting information. And if you're going to use that texture in the background, it's a good idea to make sure that that particular texture is pretty high resolution. And I have this texture here, it's three gigabytes. And let's open that image and see what happens. Now we're in rendered mode at the moment. This is important because what will happen in rendered mode with an environment texture is it will be loaded in. We can see that it jumped there massively and so is our VRAM usage and we can't see much at the moment let me just turn the strength up because it was lowered for the sky texture there we go so we can now see our environment texture nice and clearly and so we can move around our model and see everything really nicely lit up from this HDRI but you can see here we're using RAM and we're using VRAM however if we go back into solid shaded mode look at that it gets unloaded from memory. And if we change to material preview, we will see that it's very much the same as it was before. Now, something to bear in mind here is you can, under the drop down at the very end next to viewport shading, actually enable scene world, at which point it will load it back in. And I'm going to leave that in there, maybe sped up a little. You could see it took a while to load that in, even on this quite powerful computer. And it locked up, looked like it may have crashed for a few seconds whilst doing that. Finally, the same is true of textures. However, textures tend to stay in memory for a longer period of time. So if we change the material on the floor here, and again, this is a convoluted example, I'm going to go ahead, let's go to the shading editor. With the principled BSDF, I'm going to go ahead, Control, Shift, T, and let's add in all of these textures here. Bang, that's in straight away. We don't see any change as of yet. However, if we go into material preview, I'm not going to set it up to look nice or anything along those lines but in material preview we can see here we now have eight gigabytes and if i go into the full rendered mode it will take a few moments as we can see it's updating textures updating lights that basically means it's moving into memory and wow look at how much memory i'm using on my computer here that jumped up to 48 gigs and we can see here oh did i fill up my gpu memory this is a very unoptimized scene However, it does show the danger of just adding textures without thinking about why you're adding them or why you're adding such high resolution textures in the first place. And we can see Blender here is using around 19 gigs in total and our VRAM is pretty full. Simulations and VFX. The CPU takes over here in Blender. Smoke, fire and water simulations, they're all fully CPU based. Soft body and cloth simulations also are CPU driven, meaning a better GPU won't speed them up at all. Physics and rigid bodies are also CPU bound. They can benefit though from more cores on your processor. Because all of these are CPU bound, it is often essential to bake or pre-render the simulation before playing it back. So in front of us here, we have a cube that's emitting smoke. If we go ahead and play that, we will see that the CPU usage skyrockets. And depending on how good your CPU is, the faster this animation will run. It's actually caching it at the moment. We can see that with the frames per second being red over here. It's now gone white. It's able to play back that cache. And if we decide to increase the detail, so if I go to the domain itself and say that the resolution needs to be higher, everything will slow down. Let's restart the animation. Now, rather than running at nearly 20 frames per second, the simulation will be more accurate. However, it's now running at five frames per second. If I stop that and go back to the beginning, we should find it can play back again at real time. There we go. Until it reached that point where it's not cached anymore. And we can see at that point it comes up and the CPU usage is incredibly high. And this is where you'll want to come in and you'll want to make sure that you've baked your simulations rather than playing them back along with your render. If something goes wrong with this, then it will impact you massively.
In front of us here, we have a water simulation and we can see it will use the CPU. Now it's not gonna use much of the CPU at the moment because I have the resolution turned down. However, if we bump that up to 32, we're gonna have a much slower, we can see it's gone down to 12 frames per second whilst it does all the calculations. However, if we play that back after it's done the calculations, it plays back in real time. So very much the same as the smoke. Playing this through and making sure the animation is baked and working how you expect is so important before you go ahead and try and render any of this. Let's move on to video editing. There is no GPU boost here. Uh, Blender's video editor, or a VSE, a video sequence editor, is entirely CPU based. Decoding the video files, there is no GPU acceleration, meaning that your high resolution footage often needs to be converted into what known, uh, what's known as a proxy, and this can take a while to do in Blender. Effects and transitions are all on the CPU, making complex edits a lot slower. And to be honest, unless you're okay waiting for proxies to finish encoding, and by the way, that uses a ton of space on your drive as well, it's probably better to use DaVinci Resolve. It's free and miles more functional than Blender's VSE. Oh, Blender's using a lot of CPU at the moment, and I'm not doing anything. What is it doing? Oh, it was looking at all of the thumbnails. So there's another thing that Blender uses the CPU for. We're discovering lots today. So let's just grab one of the videos that I was editing earlier on. We can see immediately it's building proxy. So Blender's gonna start using the CPU. But if we were to try and play that back, we can see here that it is moving along. Pretty good actually, but it's not smooth. It's about half the frame rate it needs to be. And sometimes this will be incredibly jerky and that might even be lying. Now we've got to a part here where it looks like it's playing back smoothly, but that won't always be the case. So building these proxies in order to access and use this data is gonna be incredibly important. That takes up RAM, and that could be changed by the way. Whilst we're here, we might as well learn. Under preferences, under system, I believe it is, we've got this memory cache limit. Depending on how high that is, that is how many megabytes you're able to use. So 32,000 megabytes, this is 32 gigs. So I've actually got quite a bit of memory set aside for Blender. Here we have a disk cache as well, so we can store data on another hard drive if we want to. And I'm genuinely surprised it's actually playing this back anywhere near full speed because my testing, it was a lot lower. I am using a different codec for this time round though. So maybe that has something to do with it. So why does Apple Silicon sometimes win? Well, some Blender tasks are single threaded, meaning that even a high end CPU might struggle. Apple's M series chips have extremely fast single core performance. So those type of tasks, it basically outperforms some even more powerful, you'd have thought, CPUs in desktops. Now for rendering though, a high-end discrete GPU still wins. And yes, by the way, I would class the M4 Max with the 40 cores high-end. It has the speed of an RTX 3090 in a laptop and it can actually address up to 128 gigabytes of memory. And that's actually surprisingly useful considering the consumer 5090 only has 32 gigabytes and the R. TX6000, those were previously known as Quadro cards, the professional cards, they seem to top out around 48 gigabytes at the moment. So if you've got particularly complex scenes, that M4 Max can actually be a real benefit. So does Blender need a powerful GPU? Yes, but only in the right places. Rendering, materials and lighting, absolutely. It makes a world of difference. Simulations and video editing, not so much. And for simple modeling and sculpting tasks, you don't need much at all. Now, let me know in the comments what your biggest Blender bottleneck was. And if this helped, don't forget to like and subscribe for more Blender and tech insights. And for more Blender deep dives, check out one of these videos here.